Aloha. I'm Paul Udell. For many years, I was a newscaster and a reporter on the mainland and right here in Hawaii. Now I'm retired and I've volunteered here at Alalo to help create some programs to provide insight into the people of our community. Our first program is called Getting to Know You. It's not about politics. It's not about policy. It's about getting behind the appearances to what makes a person really tick, to what formed them into what they are today. Their likes, perhaps, their dislikes, maybe even their television shows. Our first guest is Governor Neil Abercrombie. We interviewed him at Historic Washington Place, the home, of course, of former governors and of Queen Liliuokalani. If those walls could only talk. The whole idea for me, at least at this stage in my life, is, is do what I think is the right thing and uh, we'll just let history take its course. Let's start in the beginning. What kind of uh, childhood did you have? Uh, well, we were just talking uh, before we got started about religion and, and how that can shape or, or misshape uh, people's lives. And uh, I grew up, I was born in Buffalo, New York, in what was then a very segregated city. I didn't know it, of course, as a little kid. To me, everything that you saw was the way it was. But uh, one of the distinguishing features of that city was it was, it was mostly Catholic, uh, Roman Catholic. Uh, and I was a Protestant. Uh, didn't realize all that as a little kid, but it got brought home to me very quickly. My name was Abercrombie. It wasn't Bon Giovanni. It wasn't Kelly. It wasn't Ozinski, right? It wasn't Irish. It wasn't uh, Italian. It wasn't Polish. Um, and so the overwhelming majority of the city was Roman Catholic, uh, Catholic schools, the churches were prominent. Uh, when you had Catholic charities, they, they put your name down in the back of the church. If you didn't give enough money, you know, it was in the, in the church bulletin, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I went to uh, public school 63, uh, elementary school, PS 63. And uh, once a week uh, in the early afternoon or mid-afternoon, um, uh, school would be dismissed. Uh, for those kids who were Roman Catholics who would then go to catechism classes at the church. And those of us, of course, who weren't Catholic got left in the classroom, three of us. <laughs> thanks right? a lot, huh? Yeah, thanks a lot. And you, you weren't allowed to do homework or anything. We played tic-tac-toe and, and, uh, and kind of practiced writing and, and those things, just three of us. And when we got out of uh, school, the, the Roman Catholic kids uh, uh, would be coming out of their catechism classes and uh, they'd throw stones at us or yell at us on the very solid theological grounds that they could be forgiven. So if we did the same thing back to them, of course, we were committing sins, which would be marked in a little book. So I grew up very, very early uh, understanding that some people are made into the other, and it wasn't right. Uh, I think I probably started my whole political career as a, as a little kid in you know, second, third grade, fourth grade, learning that if you had the wrong name or you maybe looked the wrong way or whatever it was, uh, that you could be, uh, you could be persecuted, you could be, uh, you could be discriminated against. I didn't know those words then. But you felt that? But I felt that. And what did your parents tell you then? My mom was a teacher. Um, uh, they always said, um, uh, do the right thing. Stand up for yourself. Uh, make sure you're doing the right thing. If you're doing the right thing, I'll, I'll, I'll back you up. I remember uh, one, on one day, with my brother and I, we were coming back, we rode our sh little Schwinn bikes. In those days, nobody worried about uh, some, you know, a predator or something. It just didn't, I don't know, I suppose it happened, Paul, but we were trusted to ride our little bikes down the street, and, I mean, on the sidewalks, and, and to go home. We were coming home from after school, and these three kids jumped out from behind a tree and shoved my, my little brother off his bike and started saying, Abercrombie, Aberzombie, Abercrombie, Aberzombie. Just because it rhymed. Right, yeah. But that was part of it. And of course, we were the wrong religion. And, and then they could make fun of our name because it was an unusual name. And I jumped off and my boy, what is that about? And I got in a fight with the biggest kid of the three kids, right? Because he shoved my little brother. I had to protect my brother. And you can't like, let anybody make fun of your name, right? You can't do that. And uh, just got it. boom, boom, boom. We got in a fight. Wild some punches and so on, and then they, they ran away, and we got our bikes and went home. The, that evening, around dinner time, uh, there's a doorbell rings and a bang, bang, bang on the door. M my dad went down to answer because it was very unusual, uh, 
And there was a man standing there, and I, I, my dad said, Neil, come down here. And I uh, went down the stairs, and there's a man standing there, and kind of to the side and a little behind him is this kid, a bigger one of the three kids that I had in a fight with. And my father said to me, this man says you hit his son. Is that true? My father was very direct. And uh, I said, yes, it's true. And he said, why? I said, he made fun of our name. And the man looks at the kid and says, is that true? And the kid goes, yes. And the man cracks the kid. Oh, man is. Oh, yeah, he cracks the kid. He said, you won't hear from us anymore, and walks away. And my father took me upstairs. He never said a word, never said a word. After that, just took me right up the stairs, a little smile. But so that's what it was. I was, I was combative. That explain what you are today? I think, yeah. yeah I, people, I, you I, are combative. Oh, well, you know, you just called that up in my memory, right? Yeah. And, uh, I, I, yeah, I thought it's not right. It's not the right thing to do. And I remember uh, Joe Rose. You remember Joe Rose? KGU used to be uh, uh, on the radio. He was uh, yeah. a commentator in the old days before there were commentators. You know, uh, radio talk show host Joe Rose was there. And I remember he got me on there. And he was a conservative guy. And he got me on when I was first in the legislature and running for the the U.S. Senate as a grad student and so on. He said, well, what made you, what, 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 what got into you? What, what, what made you know where you are? I said, Sunday school. And it really threw him. He said, what do you mean Sunday school? I said, I went to Sunday school. He said, well, how, what do you mean? I said, I learned in Sunday school, I learned big guys shouldn't pick on little guys. You ought to be fair. You should treat other people the way you want to be treated. I said, so my politics is, 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 is pretty much that. The big guy shouldn't pick on the little guy. You ought to be fair to everybody. And you should treat other people the way you want to be treated. And if you're not doing it, then you should do something about it. So that formed the basis of your thinking and your political philosophy. Let, yeah. Let's go to uh, why you came out here. You, you got a, oh. a bachelor's degree at yes. Union College, was it? I went there because of my high school teacher. A man named Frank Cower just died a couple of years ago at 92. I stayed in touch with him all my life. He changed my life when I was a junior in high school, oh, totally. So. He got up in the uh, front of the room um, uh, the very first day, the very first minute, and got up in front uh, of the class and said, I'm about to enrich your lives far beyond your ability ever to repay me. I am about to enrich your lives far beyond your ability ever to repay me. And I went, whoa, who's this? What, what's that all about? And then he picked up a book and he said, we're gonna read Shakespeare and we're gonna read Julius Caesar. And he looked around the room, and again, I haven't a clue as to why it was me. Maybe it was alphabetical. He said, uh, Neil Abercrombie, yeah. he says, you're gonna read um, Mark Antony's speech. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. And then I read the rest of it, and I thought to myself, no, he's praising Caesar. Wait a minute, this is, he's, it's the opposite of what he's saying, you know, kind of thing. And I, I learned my first thing about politics. And uh, Frank Coward, uh, from that moment on, um, I realized there was a whole other world out there, and I had to learn a whole lot. And, uh, and he was a mentor, he encouraged me, mentored me, believed in me uh, all my life. And it, it opened up the world of, of the mind and the world of, of books and ideas to me. And also probably encourage you to speak out. Well, that's why, I, that's why I went to that school. He had graduated from Union College, so I wanted to go to Union College. And then in my senior year, there on a bulletin board was a, a standing out from all everything else was a yellow sheet with a ersatz green uh, palm tree or the, the facsimile of a palm tree. And it said, Teaching Assistantships, University of Hawaii. I applied for one in sociology. So that's how you got it. You said something, uh, though, uh, just a minute ago. You said something to the effect of uh, what you learned in Mark Anthony's speech yeah. was a, a political lesson. You, political. They, po politicians say one thing yeah. and mean another. Yeah. yeah, and of course, everybody was doing it in, in the play, and I learned lots of things. It wasn't just politicians, but, or there was a, two meanings to something, or you could be saying something but meaning something else, or, or there was more to it than what was being said on the surface. Right. And what was, and I began to learn about context. You know, what is, how is, why is this taking place? What kind of forces are, are being turned loose? And the power of words, of course. The power okay, of words. You get, you get to Hawaii. Yes. First impression. Well, yeah, I got accepted. I, I can't imagine how it happened. I was no great scholar. I think that they principally wanted just to bring somebody in from far away to kind of cross fertilize the, the department or something like that. And so, yeah, I got here within uh, just after statehood, the first week of September. Uh, right after statehood in the middle of August in 1959. Yeah. You get off the plane. Propeller airplane. 
from the West Coast, yeah. And, and what, what's your reaction? What did you feel? I'll never forget. Uh, there's no international airport. This is John Rogers Airport. You, the, the, the propeller plane pulls up, and then they roll the stairs up to the doorway, right? Just outside what was called the short snorter bar uh, in those <laughs> days. And uh, the door opened up, and there was a trade wind breeze. I didn't know it was the trade winds. But there was this breeze, this beautiful breeze, fresh, refreshing. The sun it was warm. It was inviting. The, the vista in front of me was stunning, the Ko'olaos. And, and then the beach, we, could, we drove by and went down Waikiki Beach, and there was a royal. It didn't have the big uh, concrete barriers in front of it like they do now. Uh, and, and they went up to Manoa Valley, and uh, uh, that evening, got there, came here late, and so I went for a little walk, and I could smell the plumeria and the sky, because it, we were in a big city then. Um, uh, so the sky, there, there wasn't reflected light on the sky, Paul. So it was like God had thrown a bucket of, of milk stars, you know, Milky Way. I, you really saw the Milky Way in Hawaii, in the city in those days. And I thought, this is it. This is, this is, this is beyond belief. The, the, the perfume in the air, the freshness of the breeze, the, 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 the beauty of the, of the mountains, uh, and the aloha that was all around me. It was, it was paradise. Let's, paradise. Let's, let's talk about the most significant things in, in your years at UH, because you got two degrees there. You got a master's and, yeah. uh, and a PhD. What's the most outstanding thing there? I mean, you got involved in the uh, anti-Vietnam War. Was right. that it? Or? Yeah, although I never thought about it as anti-Vietnam. I always thought about it as a pro-peace idea, and I'm not trying to be cute with you on that. Um, it, I guess it was anti-Vietnam War, uh, but it wasn't so much against the war, it was why were we doing this? And why were we using the military in a, for political purposes or masking what we were doing as, a, as a, a military necessity? And I didn't believe that at all. I didn't believe it was a military necessity at all. I believe we were using the military um, uh, literally and the excuse of military necessity to mask what I thought was a... a uh, a barren uh, political uh, uh, purpose. So that, that led to your running for office? Was that the catalyst? Oh yeah, that was in, in 1970. But previous to that, as I, as I had gotten my uh, uh, scholarship, if you will, underway uh, for my master's degree in sociology and eventually my, my, uh, ma uh, my PhD, my doctorate in, in American studies, uh, part of the reason there was the great teachers at the University of Hawaii. I had, had uh, one of the best uh, graduate school education is possible. W one thing about Hawaii, we always lowball ourselves. Jack Burns said that. Governor Burns said that. We, we, we underestimate ourselves. We, we don't, complex. Yeah, I think he even used the phrase at one point. We've got a kind of inferiority complex that, that other people must have the answers and that we're going to have to ask them to give them to us. Um, th we have always underestimated the University of Hawaii and, and, and I had some of the best teachers there was an incredible eclectic group of, uh, of professors and teachers there uh, that uh, were highly stimulating. It was, it was just great. And in the process then, the, uh, the East-West Center got underway, and I began to meet people from all over the, the world, all over Asia. You know, and that's why, well, that was why I said I thought we had political uh, purposes here that were, were masking what, our actual re what the real interests of the United States uh, would, should, should be in Asia. I want to use the time back because I know your time is kind That's of short. Okay. So the things I, I, I want to ask you. It's a to do this. It's opening up a lot of things I hadn't thought about in years. I want to know, is your job as governor, is it what you thought it was going to be when you <laughs> ran? Yeah. Uh, um, I'm laughing because my dog just, yeah, she woke right up with that one. Yeah. Um, it, this is a terrible cop out, but yes and no. Um, it's what I thought it might be in the, in the, in the sense that there is an opportunity to uh, be able to get things accomplished to th this new day program that I ran on. I'm serious about it. I, I guess that's the scholar uh, part of me. I wrote everything out that I said I wanted to do so people could hold me to account for it, and I'm, I'm working very hard to get that done. And I understand the legislature, certainly, no question about that. But it's been a little more difficult than I anticipated 
partially because uh, when I was in the legislature, we were in a period of, uh, of uh, a pretty good fiscal stability, even prosperity. And uh, I was in the company of some of the uh, uh, original um, uh, founders and uh, supporters of the Democratic Party, which, which took over uh, the state in terms of political authority post-World War II. And the circumstances today, when I came in in, in, in 2010, uh, I had not fully been informed about nor uh, was fully aware of the depth of the, of the chaos that was in the state fiscally. So I had the last couple of years to spend a lot of times uh, f facing hard choices and making tough decisions and trying to make the right decisions to you get the state fiscally sound so we can move on a lot of the programs I'd like to see done. So, uh, it, yeah, it, it, it's, it's what I expected, but I, I, didn't, I, I didn't completely understand the depth to which and the breadth I would encounter with regard to the tough decisions and hard choices that were in front of us. Is that why uh, you lost your temper sometimes? I mean, I, 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 I was reading uh, Richard Barreca not too long ago. Yes, Richard, Richard is able to, let's see, I've been in politics for... Well, almost, well, 40 plus years actually now, I guess 43 years, formally, I mean, in, in electoral politics, one kind or another. And I'm sure during the 40 years you can, you can find some instances where I've been very intense in a particular situation. And uh, it's easy to conjure those up and not um, reflect on all the other thousands or tens of thousands of encounters and times and circumstances and situations in which um, my intensity was not under such uh, open display. <laughs> so you have a temper sometimes. Sure. Uh, well, I'm, I, I, it's usually, if somebody approves of what I'm doing, I'm passionate. If um, uh, they don't approve of it, it's bluster or it's uh, some other uh, opprobrium of some kind. Well, uh, you know, he quotes a House unnamed uh, leader saying you have an abrasive approach and that you're... How can a sweet-tempered uh, person like There's myself, a nice like that, right? And look at this. Does this, uh, does this look like, this dog look like she's worried about my right. temper? Well, I'm sure she bosses you yeah. around. Well, you know, um, as you say, some unnamed person. Uh, so I don't know uh, about that. But uh, maybe abrasive simply meant that I said to, to somebody that uh, what they <laughs> were saying didn't make any sense. Well, he also <laughs> says that yeah, your consultants are trying to turn yeah. you down. Don't yeah. have these explosive moments. Yes, yeah. you know? well, you swim in the water you're in. So um, uh, let me put it this way. I've been in, in uh, I think it's 34 elections uh, so far. My batting average is pretty good. So I guess the, uh, the people of, the, of Hawaii in one venue or another, including statewide, uh, have generally approved. Uh, I never ran on the basis that I was the, uh, that everybody was gonna like what I was going to do. I ran on the basis that I, and always ran on the basis um, uh, that I would try to make the best judgment I could, uh, uh, that I would, and, that, that, and, that, and the basis of that judgment would be um, my assessment as to what was good for Hawaii, and not necessarily for myself or for others, and that I wouldn't necessarily tell everybody what they wanted to hear, but I'd tell them what they needed to know as best I could figure that out. I want to go back to uh, another subject. Uh, you the famous taxi that you had. You didn't have, yes. you didn't have any money to promote yeah. yourself, so you yeah. had the taxi and they had your... your I thought that was pretty money. original. It was original. <laughs> what, what happened to the taxi, by the way? It, I gave it to uh, Public Radio. Public Radio. I helped to found Public Radio uh, with the help of Wads Yee, Senator Wadsworth Yee, and um, we did a, a legislative trade there. I backed him up on a loan for a fishing boat, and he backed me up on a, on a grant and aid for, to get public radio started. The public radio is still here, and the fishing boat's long gone. <laughs> and the taxi cab is? And the taxi cab got it. Well, what they did is they auctioned it. You know, I yeah, gave yeah. it to them. Uh, somebody got it? And uh, somebody bid on it who wanted to restore it. I couldn't restore it. It was a great ca I had three of them over time, starting from the 60s into the, in, and I kept uh, one in the 70s because they, they went out of business in the early 80s. And they went out of business, by the way, Paul, because they, the cars were built too well. They lasted too long and they couldn't keep selling them. So, so I gave it to him and he restored it and did a beautiful job. Talking about needing money, uh, I once covered a politician, Jess Under, who said, uh, 
money is the mother's milk of politics. That's the yes. famous line. Yes. And yes. Uh, that's probably true, but mm -hmm. how do you feel about raising money? Are, are you comfortable with it or what? Never bothered me a bit uh, to raise what money I could. I couldn't raise as much as other people more often than not. Uh, but uh, uh, because I always felt I was doing the right thing, and as long as, 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 as I was swimming in that water, um, I was going to swim as hard as I could and do the best that I could. When I got elected to the state legislature, two things prevailed. One, multi-member districts in Hawaii, so that you didn't have to be first, you could be third, which is what I came in. And second, there were campaign spending limits. Uh, I was up against the sons of two millionaires and a bank vice president, and I won because they couldn't spend any more money than I did. I out-organized them, I outworked them, I asked people to give me a chance, and I got 400 more votes than the person who came in fourth. So, so there were special circumstances. They were special circumstances. The, next, the very next year, Buckley versus Vallejo, the suit uh, uh, about unlimited spending, and we see the fruits of that today. We now have corporations uh, uh, designated as people, and they can spend hundreds of millions of dollars without any accountability. There are a lot of people who just don't buy into politicians. They're distrustful of them. They yes. think they're, they're beholden to special interests. They yeah. think that they are greedy and so forth. And that's just a, a perception by a, by a good number of people. Yes. That's one reason a lot of them don't vote. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's more exacerbated today than it was in the past. Um, and that uh, there's, an, there's a whole industry now devoted to debunking uh, politicians. It's not that politicians have. What was? What was? I go back in our conversation. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Right, lend me your ears. Let me let me speak to you and and uh, um, and try to convince you of something. Um, uh, so it, it isn't that there hasn't been cynicism, or skepticism, or even cynicism, uh, contempt for politics uh, throughout, or the expression of of, of electoral politics uh, throughout history. But what has happened today now? Is, is that the idea that was recognized by the, the founders of our, of, our, of our country and incorporated into the Constitution, the idea that there would be factions, that there would be special interests, and what you had to do is reconcile these, these, these factions and work something out, checks and balances. The, there's lots of checks being written now, and the balances are, are pretty hard to find. But I think I can summarize it for you pretty quickly. I've never uh, argued about whether or not there were special interests. Everybody's got a special interest. Olelo is a special interest. You and I have special interests. Uh, we're, we're males, we're females, we're, we're, we're old, we're young, we're tall, we're short. We're, there's, there's all, inside of a minute, you can come up with half a dozen or two dozen different interests that, that any one of us have. The question isn't whether there's special interest. Uh, we've always had that, institutional and otherwise. Uh, the question is, is whether your special interest becomes a private interest at the expense of the public interest. And that's where you make the appeal to the public. My argument is, if, if there's a special interest, I haven't the slightest problem in advocating for it, even though somebody says, oh, we hate that, that special interest. If I think they're on the right track, I'm going to be for them. If I think that their special interest and the public interest coincide, if your special interest becomes a private interest at the expense of the public interest, then I'm going to oppose you. That's my operating philosophy in politics, and that's what I try to, to um, espouse in any contact and interaction I have with the public, individually or in a, in a broad context. I try to indicate that whatever particular issue or slant I have on a particular issue, I try to see whether, whether that is... is uh, is synonymous with the public interest. Now, if somebody disagrees with that, then that becomes a conversation. Finally, I want to, I want to figure out, what, what do you do for relaxation? I mean, <laughs> play ball with the dog. Yeah. Huh? Walk the dog. Walk the dog. Walk the dog. Walk the dog. Yeah, Kanoa that. meets me at the door every single night I come home, no matter what time. Kanoa is there. Uh, when I get up in the morning, I, we get up together, and she knows that she has my complete attention <laughs> and it reminds me every day, no, there's other things that, uh, that I have uh, responsibility for and attention needs to be paid and, uh, and she loves me. So um, uh, there, there's that. And of course, the other, uh, the other passion is, uh, 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 that I like, I mean, that I guess defines me is, is, is exercise, weight training, which I 
really, really Let's enjoy. See. Uh, the next one is 200 pounds over your yeah, well, age, yeah. right? Well, th that was my goal up until I was, was 65 and into my 70s. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, I've had a shoulder operation recently uh, to pay for my sins of, of 50 years of, of power lifting. So um, I think I'm retired from that and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have more modest goals at this point. But, um, and the other thing, of course, is, is reading. What's your last book you're reading? Well, what are you reading? You know, that, it's interesting. Um, it, it, it's a book, but it, uh, it, it, it comes as a result of, of another book, which is maybe almost my favorite, which is Seven Pillars of Wisdom by T.E. Lawrence. Yeah. Uh, Lawrence of Arabia comes from that. And what I, my, the last thing that I read was a book accompanying the 50th anniversary uh, a, a DVD Blu-ray edition of uh, Lawrence of Arabia, the 1962 uh, David Lean production, of course. And this was a book uh, that recounted how that movie was made and uh, what was involved in it and so on. What do you watch on TV? Uh, we watched The Killing recently. We went uh, through, through, through that. Uh, that was uh, terrific. Uh, we recorded Downton Abbey. We, uh, yeah, I, um, uh, I was a big fan of The Wire. I thought for a long time I was the only person in the United States that was following the wire. I got in touch with David Simon just to let him know, please keep going. You know, they're, they're, we're out here. Yeah. We're listening. Yeah. We're, we're viewing. Yeah. We're, we're with it. Show. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was wonderful. And the original House of Cards is terrific with Ian Richardson. Uh, politics, right? Uh, he speaks directly to the camera. There's a sense of irony. We were talking before about cynicism and skepticism in, in uh, politics. He's, of course, a complete rogue. Uh, a, a completely uh, cynical about his role in parliamentary politics in England, but he's so witty and so avuncular, you got to forgive him for it. So it, 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 it still comes down to entertainment. And so I, I really enjoy that. Thank you for spending your time Thank with you, us. Thank you, Paul. I think Wonderful. we know you a little bit better. I hope so. <laughs> Words no, and all. I'm not so sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. Words <laughs> and all. That's right. Thank you. What do you think, Kanoa? Huh? What do you think? Okay. <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's ready, Perfect. right? You she's see? ready. Downward dog. She's she's bored and know, she's, she's ready to bored. go for the walk. You got to listen to her now when you make your yeah. speeches. When oh. she gets up, <laughs> stop. Oh. See? Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. She's decided to forgive me for a little longer. <laughs> you. Okay. Did, did you guys get that? Some of them are going. <laughs>